It's good to see you guys. I hope you guys are doing well. My name is Adam, uh, student pastor here. Uh, if you are in the fireside room, if you're in Fontana or you're watching online, we just wanted to say welcome. Listen, do you guys know Fontana? It goes down every week. Did you know that? We had to take a quick side note. We always say hi to them over there, but every week at the 10 o'clock gathering, there is a community over there that is unlike anything that I've seen in, in quite some time. My favorite part is half the time I go there, I get welcomed by people and they say, are you new here? And it's just, it's so cool. If you haven't checked it out, you need to. Um, and, and just while I, I, I have kind of the, the stage, to be honest, um, can we get up for those interns a little bit? Those are, those are, those are our interns. Like, I'm a proud papa. Like, they did a really good job. And Listen, I also get the opportunity to, um, to oversee kids in care, and by oversee, I mean keep up with Cynthia and Shelly and all the amazing work that they're doing. And so can we just say thank you to Cynthia and her team for our kids' ministry. <laughs> Guys, our kids' ministry is really good. It's really good. And if you're looking for somewhere to serve, like, that's a great place to start. Just make sure you actually like kids before you do it, Okay. <laughs> And then with Shelly, I mean, I mean, she's been here since like the start of this place and she cares so well for each and every one of you. We're just so fortunate to be able to have such awesome people here. Now, for this weekend, I, I, I'm really excited because over the last couple of weeks, what we've been doing is we've been looking at Old Testament characters and we have been seeing how their journey has done their part in paving the path in order that the true hero, Jesus, can come and fulfill what he said he was going to fulfill. And as I prepped into this week, um, what I had realized, even just with stuff that came up in my own life, is that we have a crisis at hand, and that crisis is an identity crisis. And what I mean by that is that being in a Western world, in Southern California, and even in Rancho Cucamonga specifically, there are things that are constantly pulling for that number one slot when it comes to our identity. And whether that's the job that we have, it's the things that we possess, or even something as just, uh, just as, as simple as being a, a mom or a dad or an aunt or an uncle or a husband or a wife or whatever the case, those things are kind of just pulling for that. And Here's the thing, is that right up top, I'm going to give you like your one take home that you can take for the rest of the week. So if you forget anything else that I say, you're welcome, okay? Now here's the thing, identity, as it's defined, it is not who I think I am, it's who God says I am. That's it. That's today. You mean, I'm just kidding, don't leave, right? But that's it. Identity is not what I have. It's not who I think I am. It's not the voices that speak loud in my mind. It's who God says I am. But the thing is, is that many of us in this room are walking through what would be considered an identity crisis because the voices speak louder than God's truth. That there's some of us in this room who for far too long have allowed our identities to be wrapped up in the wrong thing. For some, it's your identity is the mental illness that you've been working through. And you don't know yourself outside of depression or anxiety. Or for some of you, the identity that you hold on to is, is your past. And it's not something that you feel like you can overcome or it will ever be separated from who you are. But who God says you are is his beloved son and daughter, and he will be able to carry you through whatever it is he's called you to as long as we walk in that reality. Now, I went through a little bit of an identity crisis myself in high school, okay? Uh, I know that you guys uh, have heard me talk about this before. It's sort of embarrassing when I look back at it, but I was in a band when I was in high school. The band was called Apple Not Asteroid, and it was our way of saying that we believed that God created things. And Think about it for a second, right? We thought we were so clever. <laughs> I was the guy who was known kind of like, I, I wore the band t-shirts and the girl jeans because skinny jeans didn't exist, okay? I was the guy who would throw his guitar around everywhere and I just thought that like, we, I thought we were really cool, but if we drove 30 minutes in any direction, people didn't know who we were, right? If you don't believe me, check this out. I mean, that's what it looked like when I was in high school. Like, I grew out my hair. I straightened it with a flat iron. I would dye it black with some bleach spots. So when I did this, it felt different every time. And I was just, that, that was me. That's, that's who I wanted. That's, my identity was that. And honestly, like, I, I grew out of most of that except for the tight pants and, like, everything else. Like, we're good. Like, this is a Tommy Bahamas t-shirt, okay? I'm making my way into adulthood, Okay. 
But you would think that I would grow out of it, but no, this is a picture of me playing a show at APU. I was in college, and that guy on the left, his name is Wes. He's a big bearded guy. I love him. I don't remember who that was on the right, but they're having a great time, right? <laughs> but that was, that was me. I was going to do that. But a lot of you know, you know my story. I, I've told it before, but if you're new, and uh, when I was a senior in high school, God clearly called me into ministry because when my best friend died of an inoperable brain tumor. I spoke at her memorial, and that's where God said that's what you need to do. In actuality, yesterday would have been Carla's 29th birthday, right? It's interesting how it works. But he called me into ministry, and there was that battle back and forth for a really long time. And it was because I was not walking in an accurate understanding of who I was in Jesus. I was doing the things that I wanted to do, and I was not about the things that he wanted me to be for. Now, today we'll be in Judges chapters 4 and 5, and then we'll hop over to Matthew 4 as well. But the character that we're going to be talking about this weekend was somebody who, luckily for us, was very confident in their identity, very confident in who God said that they needed to be. They had a very specific task in order to complete one of God's missions. And if it weren't for their confidence and their identity, then it, was, it just wouldn't have panned out that way. And the cool thing is that this person is Deborah. Starting off, Deborah's really cool. Guys, like, I don't know if you've ever read about Deborah, but she's a strong, independent woman who don't need no man, okay, first of all. <laughs> Secondarily, she's one of the only women, especially in the Old Testament, whose success was not dependent on a man. This ain't no Disney movie kind of a situation here. That actually, at this time, the Israelites, they, they had been messing up. This book is called Judges because they're being judged in the sun. They just keep dropping the ball. And honestly, the guys, the Israelite men, um, they, were, they just, honestly, they were incompetent is what it was. And so God, in the midst of understanding that, that these men were incompetent, assigns Deborah to, to lead the Israelites. And one of the only female judges that, that we see and what's happening in, in this time is that they were subjugated under about, about 20 years of uh, King Jabin's rule. And subjugated means they just were taken over. They were conquered, right? So they were subject to King Jabin's rule. And he had this right-handed man named Sisera, okay? Sisera was in charge of the army. And this army was known for its 900 plus ironclad chariots where they were able to outrun and overcome pretty much any force that came their way. And, and they, just, they, they just left nobody as, as a result. But there was this relationship between King Jabin and the Israelites where even though they weren't treated the best at all, this rule still existed. So God sends Deborah to be able to kind of initiate this, this plan to overthrow. So this is how it goes. Deborah chapter, not Deborah, Judges chapter 4, verse 4. Now Deborah, a prophet, before I get going, um, there's going to be a lot of big names. There's going to be a lot of words. We're going to track together, so don't get lost in the names, okay? But we'll make sure we're all on the same page. Because as it came to the first one, I'm like, oh, yeah. Now, Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. So she held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have, disp to have their disputes decided. So listen, ready? So she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, and Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, so... She's calling one of her guys by the name of Barak, and she's about to tell him what God is telling her what the next move is. So she says, the Lord, the God of Israel commands you, go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them out to Mount Tabor, and I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. And this wonderful man of Israel says, if you go with me, I'll go, but if you don't, I'm not gonna. <laughs> That's the men that we got to deal with in this time. That literally, this is a decree from God given from his leader saying, go and take these people and overthrow. And instead of saying, yes, sounds good, he says, listen, I'll go if you go, but if you don't, no, nope. right? 
And what's interesting is that this exchange, for some of us, this is how we've been living our lives. That God, he calls us to do something specific, and instead of saying, yes, God, I'll go, I trust you, we say, yeah, but, but you don't get, and why? And that's not how it should be. Because if we walk, again, in the identity, not who we think we are, but who God says I am, right? When we do that as sons and daughters of God, if God calls us, he will, in his father nature, take care of us the way he needs to, right? So he goes on, Deborah, she's a great leader. She says, verse 9, certainly I'll go with you. Of course I will. Despite you, I will go. But because of the course that you're taking, the, the honor is not going to be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, and there Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command, and Deborah also went with him. So what happens is that Sisera, he gets word that Deborah and Barak are kind of like on their way, and So he starts to flee on the chariot, and God in his mastery makes things happen so that his chariot becomes useless, and he begins to flee by foot. And basically, what ends up happening picks back up in verse 17, and this is where it gets pretty pretty awesome. Verse 17, chapter 4, Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Because there was an alliance between Jabin and King of Hazor and the family of Heber the Kenite. Uh, basically, he thought it was safe. Okay, that's what that's saying. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. Verse 19, he says, I- I'm-, I'm thirsty. So please give me some water. And so she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. And he said, stand in the doorway of the tent. If somebody comes by and asks you, is anyone there, say no. Do you understand what's happening? So he goes to this tent that is an apparent alliance between his king and the Hittites. And pretty much he goes in there and he gets covered and he kind of gets taken care of. And he tells Jael, hey, if anybody comes to the door, tell them that I'm not here. But are you all ready for the biggest plot twist that you ever heard other than Jesus himself? You ready for this? I, I'm, are you ready for this or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I hope so. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm ready. Here we go. Verse 21. Check it out. Check it out. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple in the ground and he died. How cool is that? (laughs) Guys, the Bible has cool stories in it, right? I didn't see that coming. Clearly, Sisera didn't either because he was sleeping. Then it goes on, verse 22. Just then Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, a little late to the game, right? And Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said. I will show you the man you're looking for. And in case you missed it before, so he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple dead. Verse 23, on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. Because of Deborah's faithfulness and her firm identity and who God told her she was, this was able to play itself out. And instead, you would think that a a guy like Barak would say, man, this might be an opportunity for my name to be written down in history forever a certain way. No, no, his identity was not firm in who God said he was. And so instead, he threw in the yeah, but and the how about instead of yes, God, I'll go. And here's the other interesting part, is that Deborah in this moment, she had a unique role that she was supposed to play. She wasn't trying to be someone that she wasn't. She wasn't trying to fake it until she made it. She, she knew that the, the responsibility that she had was independent of what God needed from her. So this was no like, um, you guys ever seen the movie Mulan before? You guys know that movie I'm talking about? Listen, I had a friend, it's actually uh, one of the, the pastors on staff, who said uh, that, that Mulan was down there with, like, Anastasia and, like, those, like, low, I'm like, that's not true, guys, come on, Mulan, right? Now, listen, Mulan, you know the story, she pretends to be 
male so that her dad doesn't have to go to war because he's too old. So the whole time he, she is trying to uh, kind of just keep things a secret until everything kind of comes out and she has to backtrack in order to prove herself and spoiler alert, she wins. And I think Eddie Murphy was there, right? So now... <laughs> It's not one of those things. This was not a trying to be some kind of mega warrior that she wasn't. No, she was exactly who she needed to be. She walked confident in who God said that she was. And if you go over to Judges chapter 5, verse 7, um, she, she's writing down and, and is celebrating through song. And there's an interesting part in this passage that I, I, I hope that we can all catch together. It goes like this, uh, chapter 5, verse 7. Villagers in Israel... Would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. God chose new leaders, and when the war came to the city gates, but not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. Did you guys catch the part that was unique to her? Go back to verse 7. Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a what? A mother. The men at this time were not doing what they were supposed to do. And so rather than trying to fulfill the role of a man in this time, God sent exactly who he needed to send. And can you imagine if in that time, instead of saying, yes, God, I'll go, that instead she said, God, me, I don't think I could do that. Or God, I live in a time of day where people, and even men specifically, they couldn't care less about what a female has to say. This just isn't for me. Or imagine if she said, God, are you aware of the fact that Sisera has over 900 ironclad chariots that could just wipe us out in a minute? And aside from the wars and the chariots and the tent pegs and temples and things like that, how familiar does this sound in, in some of our lives? How often do we just go straight to this identity crisis that exists within all of us. The voices that are in our head that, that try to dissuade us from who it is that God says we are. See, now luckily for us, just as Deborah was sent as the mother for Israel, God sent his son as the son of man. And we have the perfect example of what it looks like to have a firm identity in God. This whole series, we take these Old Testament characters so that we could point them to, to Jesus, who sets the most perfect example. And Jesus, in the very beginning of his ministry, showed us what it looks like to have this perfect identity in God. So in the beginning, and this will be in Matthew chapter 4. So Jesus just gets baptized. He fulfills the prophecy. After that, the Spirit leads him out into the desert with Satan. And translated down, it just pretty much means the tempter, okay? So Jesus is out there, and he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And he's toward the end of it. And I don't know about you, but even when I get like 40 minutes after a meal, I'm thinking about my next, okay? So Jesus is 40 days in. It's not an exaggerated number. 40 days in, he's living off of what God is providing, and he is probably physically the weakest he's ever been, but spiritually the strongest. And so this tempter comes, and the first interaction that they have is they go up to the, these rocks, and Satan says, listen, if you, you got these rocks, if you're really hungry and you really are who you say you are, why don't you turn these rocks into bread so that you don't got to be hungry anymore? And Jesus' response, turning to Scripture, says, no, no, man does not live off of bread alone, he lives off of God, and they move on to the next. They go up to a cliff and Satan says, listen, if, if you are the son of God and God is your dad, then why don't you just hop off and the angels will come and save you. And again, referring to scripture, Jesus says, no, no, you do not test God. Quick side note. Every time temptation came Jesus' way, he referred to God's word. And I think that for each and every one of us, if we're in that season of not knowing which way we should go or how we should respond or react to things that life throws our way, this would be a very, very, very good place to start. Okay? But this third interaction, if we don't miss it, we will miss something huge. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, the last part of the temptation goes like this. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, this I will give you if you just bow down and worship me. 
And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left and the angels came and attended him. But listen, here's the thing. Jesus came down for the very individuals, the very kingdoms that Satan showed him in this moment. That literally Jesus came to bring the heavenly kingdom down to overtake the earthly kingdom. What happened here is not just a moment of temptation. What happened here is that Satan was giving Jesus a ticket out of death. He's saying all the things that you've come here for, that you will eventually die for, that you will eventually give your life for, I'll give it to you now. All you got to do is just bow down and worship me. And often I think we forget that Jesus is fully God and fully human, which means that there was every chance in the world that Jesus could have leaned into the human part of him and said, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. The whole death thing, like, wow, sign me out of that. But he didn't. His identity was set in who God said he is so that he can come and die for you and for me. That if it weren't for this moment in the beginning of his ministry showing us the identity that he has in his father, then you and I would not get access to the creator of the universe ourselves. Because remember, everything went wrong back in Genesis chapter 3. Whenever my kids tell me that's not fair, I say, fairness left in the garden. Sorry, child. Right? Adam and Eve walking in perfect, perfect unity with God. A perfect understanding of their identity in him. And because they thought they knew better, they messed it up for all of us. But God, in that moment, rather than justifiably saying, away with you, initiates the biggest rescue mission of all time that you will ever see. Amen. And that's in his son, Jesus. And in order for us to gain access to this eternity, because he wants to spend forever with each and every one of you and, and me, we need to walk in an accurate understanding of our identity in him. Because you are not your job. You are not your family. You are not your depression, your anxiety. You are not your past. You are a beloved son and daughter of God. And there is no doubt in my mind that if we can get to a point, even just a little bit closer and walking in that identity, that we would be able to live out the realities of those Romans 8, 28s, that God will work for good all those who believe in him. And it might not mean good in our minds, but it means good in God's mind. And if it's good in God's mind, then it should be good for you and me, right? So I wonder what would happen if we walked in a more accurate understanding of who God says I am as opposed to who I think I am. And so to kind of wrap things up, I want to give you guys four things to take home. There is, a, there is fruit. There is a byproduct to having a firm understanding of our identity in Christ. When we walk confidently in who God says we are, things come out of it. Number one, a firm identity in Christ, it enables us to know God deeply, okay? When we understand who we are in accordance to who God says that we are, we will learn new and more things about God than we could ever ask or imagine. No longer will we have to battle with those voices inside our head. And honestly, one of the best ways to get to know God deeply is right here in the Word of God. God loved each and every one of us not only to send a son to die in our place, but to provide words in order that we may get to know him better. And you could read this thing a hundred times over, and you will still learn new things after new things after new things about God, because while our time is here on earth, we will never know everything about him, and that's what makes him worth worshiping, because the wonder and the awe and the excitement of following a powerful God are the things in which that give us that energy to continue in the path that he set us out for. But so often, I, I think what happens, I know it did for me early on in my ministry, this, this, the only part that this played in my life was uh, on a shelf next to the devotional that I maybe did once or twice so that when people came over, they at least saw that the Bible's in my house. That we have this like owner's manual on how to like understand, like listen, if, if this was a book, an owner's manual about my wife, y'all, I'd open it, Right? Like every morning, I would, I would open it, and I would be like, oh, yeah, okay, yep, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, hmm, yeah. Oh, I could have, um, why didn't I think of that, right? Th the forks go down in the dishwasher, not up, so you don't stab yourself. That's great. Okay, fine, right? I'd read it, but we don't sometimes. And, and, and the creator of the universe who wants to know you intimately, you can get to know him in here, and that exists. And the more we understand about who God is, 
the deeper we will know him personally and the sooner we'll be able to walk in an accurate understanding of who he says I am. And that helps out on the second one is that it, it basically affirm identity in Christ that enables us to stand firmly. And I know proper grammar is stand firm, but I needed my lees, okay? So that they're all lees. But listen, one thing that we know about life is peaks and valleys. If I'm on a peak, chances are valleys around the corner. If I'm in a valley, soon enough, I'm sure I'll, I'll be able to get out of it. And so the deeper we know God, and it'll allow us to stand firm in the reality of how powerful he is over our circumstance. That when we look back at understanding what he did for us in this rescue mission, that if he defeated death, then in comparison to the things that I've got going on right now, then yeah, he can handle it. And so when the waves of, of life and everything gets to be a little bit crazy, the, the deeper our roots are in who God is, the better we'll be able to stand firm in this. And listen, a lot of us maybe have an inaccurate understanding of like how God the Father works because there's probably plenty of us in this room who do not have a good relationship with their dad. And maybe it's been kind of skewed as a result. But like this rescue mission that he sent out for you. The, the, the best way, my, my wife kind of helped me kind of see this one. Have you guys ever seen that, that movie Taken, right? Liam Nielsen? I will find you and I will kill you, right? You know what I'm talking about? Take that, multiply it by more than you could ever imagine. And God sent out on a rescue mission for you. And when we know that, that he did that for us and conquered death at the same time, we'll be able to stand firm in those things. Thirdly, a firm identity in Christ enables us to walk confidently. Galatians 2.20, it's not on there, but you could write it down. It says this, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So the life that I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, listen, who loved me and gave his life for me. So in the same light that we follow pursue and worship a God who conquered death, when it comes to the things that he sends us to do, we can walk confidently that if it is in alignment with his will, that it will succeed. And that where my iniquities come up and where I fall short, the God of the universe steps in. That when I reach points that I don't have what it takes that I lose my energy, that I lose my natural ability, that the supernatural kicks in so that I don't mess it up. We just got to get out of the way sometimes. And here's the thing is that each and every one of us in our own unique way has been issued out a command and a commission to usher God's people back into his presence. And just like Deborah, who had a very specific way of going about God's mission, just like Jesus, who had a very specific way about going about God's mission, the most important way, right? You and I have unique things that we must do in order to bring people into the presence of God. And we can walk confidently in it. If we're doing that, we can walk confidently that he's there. So here's the thing. The way I do it is going to be different than the way you do it, Okay. The environment that I'm in, I'm around church people and junior hires who wear too much axe, okay? <laughs> so the way that I go about bringing people into the presence of Jesus is going to be different than yours. Like for me, listen, listen, for me, like I, God has gifted me the spiritual gift of one-upping people and planning. And so it's like, let's do this. And I'm like, yeah, let's do this, right? Last year when we were talking about Daniel for our winter camp, I was actually online looking how much it would cost to rent a lion, a live one, to bring <laughs> to camp. To bring to camp in a cage. But then, you know, mentor of mine said, you should ask other people things. And so I bring rational thinking people in and they said, don't do that, right? But the way I go about it is going to be different than the way you go about it. Listen, there's some of you in this room right now who have to act like Jesus because you can't talk about him at work. Like you're not allowed to. The way you go about it is going to be different than, than the person sitting next to you. There's some of you that are in work environments where Jesus does not come up. It's allowed to come up, but you would probably be the weird one if you brought it up. But God has commissioned you. This 
great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and surely I will be with you to the very end of the day. That's not the great suggestion. It's a great commission. It is a command, and it is a commission that God wants to be on with you. He could do it himself. But as his sons and daughters, he's equipping and sending each of us to say, no, 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 I can, but I, I, I want you to do it. So we can walk confidently in who he says we are in the things that we need to do. And lastly, a firm identity in Christ enables us to love unconditionally. See, we live in a world of condition, period, end of story. If you're not for something, you're against it. If you're against it, you're a bigot. Everything that you say probably offends somebody in some way, shape, or form. I've probably already offended somebody, right? That's the world that we live in today. But here's the thing. When we walk in an accurate understanding of our identity in Christ and God as the beloved sons and daughters of the Most High, we start seeing things a little bit different. And I have quotes that I carry around from time to time, and I've shared this one before, but it's from this guy named Brian Houston. He's the pastor at Hillsong. Um, have you heard of it? Um, but basically it goes like this. Anyone regularly immersed in the word of God has no reasonable excuse to live life offended. I'm going to say it again. Anyone regularly immersed in the word of God has no reasonable excuse to live life offended. Because if I'm regularly in the word of God, I will understand this rescue mission that God orchestrated was just as much for me as it is for the person that I hate the most. Amen. That it goes over all. Unconditional means without condition, which means that it's not a matter of I will love you if you change, fill in the blank, be this way, be that way, whatever. We get in this mindset that we are the ones who do the saving when in actuality it is Jesus, my friends. Amen. And so... It's important that we walk in that understanding. It doesn't mean that we condone. It doesn't mean that we condemn. But what it does mean is that we walk alongside people when God says to. And that we love them until they ask us why. And when they ask us why, we are sure that our answer is rooted, like Jesus, in Scripture. That we be the, probably the, the, the most accurate representation of the God of the universe that we could possibly be as human beings. See, when our identity, again, it's not about who I think I am. It's about who, who God says I am. You know, we have global partners here. We, we got a team uh, leaving tomorrow or today for Kenya, right? Are they in here? Is that y'all? I see t-shirts, but maybe that's not you. But listen, here's the thing. We got a team going to Kenya. It's great. And one of the partners that we have there is ELI, and we have a uh, living room. And here's the cool thing. There's a gal by the name of Julie who um, runs the, the living room. And she actually got the, the impression from God on her heart to open up this uh, hospice care uh, for, for Kenyans. And, uh, but it was not in proper alignment with ELI's mission. So Don Rogers, the, the owner, he, he, he blessed her on her way because he knew who God said he was and what he needed to do, and she knew who God said she was and what she needed to do. So because of their departure from one another, now more and more people actually get to experience the love of God. And as a result, just practically speaking, the living room has currently hosted 1,883 patients as well as 544 community patients. I'm not done. Hold on. <laughs> Totaling support listen, of 120,000 grieving families. Now we can clap because that's a lot. I didn't mean to cut you off, but... Well, it's there, right? Or I think of uh, Lalitha Kumar, uh, which is Suresh's mom. Uh, Suresh is the one who is our global partner with Harvest India. Um, her mom, his, his mom, in a time in, in India where honestly it wasn't even safe to be a woman with a voice, decided to put everything aside because of who God called her to be. And as a result, there have been over one million people served through Harvest India. God is on the move with that kind of stuff. It's amazing. Now listen, even more practically, bringing it back here, bringing it back here on campus. Like, did you guys know? Did you guys know that we have a prayer team here? that just regularly, often, uh, unashamedly gets up early and prays for you. Did you know that? Yep. Front row knows that. <laughs> I think because half y'all are on it, right? Yeah. Now here's the thing. Back in the 80s, 90s, 
there was this impression that God placed on an individual by the name of Nancy Jesudis, who decided to be able to say, listen, listen, this place needs to be covered in prayer. And, you know, I, I've only been here two years, but hearing the history of this place is phenomenal, y'all. Notice that there was a need and the only available space for prayer was apparently in like, in like a closet. And so out of this closet, there's this, this prayer ministry that began and there were other women around her that said, we want to learn how to pray like that. So because of her hard work and efforts, this, this team grew. And so God eventually calls her into, uh, out of state in Ohio, but along the way um, gets to meet a, a beautiful woman by the name of Kathy Martin in around 2000. Now, I didn't have the opportunity to meet Kathy myself because the Lord called her home in about 2014 after um, a battle with cancer. But um, I tell you what, the legacy that lives on in, in that woman is, is a legacy that for those of you who are part of the prayer team and are now hearing about the prayer team have a lot to do with this, this lady named Kathy. That she was relentless in her prayer for the people of Hillside, for what God was up to at Hillside. And then along the way, got to meet this woman by the name of Teresa Landorf. And I don't, yeah, we can give it up for Teresa, because hold up, listen. <laughs> Teresa Landorf is a prayer warrior. And that passage in Thessalonians 5, 17, where it says, never stop praying, she doesn't. <laughs> She's praying all the time, all the time. Tuesday morning, there's a group every day, every day at 6 a.m., there's a crew that wakes up and prays for you. If you've ever wondered if you've been prayed for, you have. You have. Now, awesomely enough, Teresa, Miss Teresa, she is leaving for Kenya today. I have a challenge for you to be able to walk alongside her as a hillside family to maybe one day this next couple of weeks get up get here at 6 and pray for her. She's paid, she's paid for you. But because of who God called her to be, who God said she is, she moved forward, and because of that, we have an army of prayer warriors here at Hillside. And that's the thing for each and every one of you. Your identity is not who you think you are. It's who God says you are. You are a child of God. You are a beloved son and daughter. When God sees you, he does not see your past. He does not see the shame you carry. He's not disappointed. He's not ashamed. He looks at you with pure adoration as his kid. And so, God, as we come before you this, this, this afternoon, that you, would, um, that you would just wreck us in this moment, honestly, that you would take anything that we've carried in here today and that we throw it to the side and that we would walk in confidence in the fact that you call us your children. And because you call us your children, God, you have sent your son for us so that we may be reunited with you, that sin doesn't matter anymore. God, that that stuff, it, it is so small in comparison to who you are. So whatever I, our identity is this weekend, wherever that lies, God, I pray that you enable us to walk in the reality of who you say we are. God, we, you've chosen us. You've not left us. God, you've built us into... In, um, a family that has the means and capacity to bring glory and honor to your name. But God, it starts with who you say we are, not who we think we are. So be with us. God, as we sing this last song, I pray that it is a prayer over our lives and the lives of everyone in this room. God, that we may um, worship you. God, that we may see you soon. We love you and it's in your name we pray.